Uh, thank you all. Okay, I guess we're being recorded. All right, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the Complete Streets Advisory Committee meeting for November 8th of 2021. We do have a very ex full agenda today, very exciting agenda. Uh, so let, let's get started. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, just some housekeeping here. Remember to keep your uh, mic muted the meeting unless you have a question. If you are using the phone, please use uh, dial star six to unmute yourself. And if you want to ask a question, please raise your virtual hand. And if you're and if, uh, using your phone, do a star nine. As always, we do our Mentimeter. We have some questions throughout all the, the, the presentations throughout the, the meeting. So I'll give a couple of minutes, or a couple of seconds for you guys to uh, either scan the QR code that you see on the screen, or you can go to menti.com. You, <clears throat> you have the email, uh, the actual the link right there in the presentation, or you can go to the voting code 54996872. <clears throat> so I'll give a few seconds for you guys to uh, log into Mentimeter. We, are have, we do have a few questions uh, for some of our presentations. Um, Okay, give me a couple of seconds here. Okay, perfect. I think that's enough time. I think we'll mentimeter. meter com voting code, or you can just scan the QR code that's on your screen. As always, we'll start with some quick announcements uh, about some things that are coming up or our current MPO efforts. Safe routes to school. Um, the application period is currently open, actually opened up in November, uh, September 1st, 2021. It closes on December 31st at the end of this year. Please visit uh, www.srtsflorida.fl.org uh, and can scroll down to this. There's a lot of information there. For more information, please contact Thomas Miller. He is at the point of contact at, at District 4. Uh, his uh, phone number and uh, email are on the slide that you see before you. Also, a complete streets and other localized missions program, the CISLIP, the cycle six application deadline is in two days. Uh, due applications are due November 10th at 5 p.m. Applications may be submitted uh, on the uh, on the CISLIP page. Uh, so it's a very it's a submittal. If you miss the annual application workshop, it is or it's in our website. Let's take a look at it. It gives you a little more direction on how to apply for um, for projects under this program with the Barrett and PO. If you have any more questions, comments, please contact the CSLIP manager, Carrie McNeil. Her contact information is in this, uh, you can see it there, McNeil at BardenPO.org or 954-876-0072. It's a good reminder, uh, we are in the middle of planning our next Say Street Summit. The 22 Say Street Summit will be, will be held in Miami at the International Miami Hotel at the same place where we had it two years ago. We have a save the date, so please mark this on your calendars, February 17 and, and 17 and 18, 2022. We have a, a, our theme for this year's Resilient and Adaptive Streets. Uh, please uh, mark that on your calendar. We are pretty excited about uh, the, the program that we're putting together for you guys. As always, the, the main day, day of the event is that Friday, February 18th. And we're planning some mobile workshops the day before that Thursday. So mark that on your calendar, please. And the next person, oh, no, we have a quick update. Stephanie Garcia will give us a quick update on our tactical urbanism program. Stephanie. Thank you so much, Ricardo. I'm Stephanie Garcia. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you so much. So before tactical urbanism, I just would like to provide a, a quick overview of what we did last week. 
just uh, last week was full of webinars, right? So one of the webinars that we had was the Open Streets webinar. We had the participation from the Ciclavia team in LA, and also we had all uh, the Minneapolis Open Streets representative uh, telling us about, you know, what exactly an Open Streets event looks like, and they actually gave up advice to the Broward County representatives, you know, how uh, we could implement an event like this. So it was a really interesting webinar. And actually we had one question as part of the webinar and the question was, name cities, communities in Broward where a Ciclovia event will have a great impact. And uh, as you can see in the results, uh, most of the uh, city representatives uh, choose the city of Fort Lauderdale as one of the areas that we should, we could host a Ciclovia event. Um, something also exciting that is coming, and this is something that we make part of the first survey, follow-up survey about Open Street, okay. is the, the Broward Ciclovia Planning Committee. You know, this is coming up. Uh, so if you are interested in learning more about these, you can use your smartphone to scan this code, and it will take you directly to the survey and in order to for us to uh, select the dates for the upcoming uh, community, uh, community, no, committee meetings for the, to plan to start planning the Ciclovia or Open Streets event in here in Broward County. And if we go to the next slide. Now let's talk about Bitactica. So uh, on Saturday, November 6th, we had our last public meeting before implementation of the pilot project in the city of Deerfield Beach with the community uh, Tether neighborhood. And we actually uh, host already three workshops. This was the last public meeting. The idea was to present the final designs that we are going to, in, uh, uh, to install. And I uh, just wanted to provide you know, some information that public outreach is, is key in order to implement this typology of projects. And uh, we work with the city of Digital Beach in order to make this happen. So I just wanna uh, you know, mention here that this, the city of, of Digital Beach was key in order for us to, to you know, work with the community there to receive their feedback and also to incorporate their comments into the final designs. Yeah, this is a picture of Eric Power. Uh, he presented you know, some updates and we also had our street plans collaborative consultant uh, telling us about what exactly we're going to do there. And if we go to the next slide. Thank you, Ricardo. And this is what we are going to do. You know, basically the scope is uh, uh, is to implement a uh, different type of improvements to a slow down traffic on Northeastern Avenue. And how we're going to do this? Well, this is just one peak of what exactly we are going to do in one of the intersections. This is one of the most dangerous intersections at the corridor. This is Northeast 44 Street. Uh, actually this area, just that little segment between Sample and 48 had uh, almost 500 uh, crashes. Uh, no, uh, sorry. Yeah, 400, uh, uh, almost 500 uh, collisions and uh, three fatalities. And this intersection, Northeast 44, is, is the most dangerous. This has only a stop signs, nothing else. And uh, at night, uh, there is a lack of lighting and people actually, you know, speeding. So, and, and the, the, we work with the, the, with the county in order to get a speeding uh, metrics. And the average of a speed for this segment is, a, well, first of all, I have to mention the a speed limit is 30 miles per hour, and the average of speed is almost 50 miles per hour. So of course, there, there is something that we need to do there, and we're going to do it through the Bitactical Pilot Project. And we go to the next slide. So how are we gonna do this, right? So this is hands-on, uh, well, we need all the hands. <laughs> we need all the help that we can have. And of course, MPOS staff will be helping community leaders and community participation will be key to install this pilot project. But I think most importantly, the opportunity is open for our CSAC members and in general for you know all the MPO friends uh, that would like to be part of this event. Uh, we are going to install uh, the pilot project in the, the second week of December. So the week of December 6th, from the 7th to the 11th. So if you are interested in helping us 
make this project a reality, you know, help us paint, help us outlining the design, et cetera, et cetera. And you are invited. Uh, there is no cost, it is totally free. And uh, yes, just scan the QR code. We love QR codes here at the MBO. <laughs> so scan it and it will take you to the volunteering opportunities uh, survey. You just need to provide your t-shirt size because we will provide t-shirts and your contact information so we can keep you up to date about the dates, ex the exact times and how exactly, what exactly we are going to do there. And yeah, I think that's the last slide. Oh no, I almost forget about this. We had a webinar last week on November 4th. Uh, we presented, you know, an update of the uh, uh, B-Tactica program. And of course the open call for projects. It is right now, uh, you know, available. This is the link you could access. I provided the information last week. Uh, if you're interested in submitting a pilot project for 2022, the corporate project is open and the deadline is November 15. Right now you have the opportunity to contact us if you have any questions before submitting your project. Uh, it's simple, the, the application is simple, uh, but if you have any questions, just contact me, you know, I'm here uh, via phone or email. And yeah, hopefully we get some exciting projects for 2022. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. And, and I just can't speak highly enough of the city of Deerfield Beach. They've been an excellent mm -hmm. partner. They've done everything they, they could on their end to make this sure this to make sure that this project is moves forward uh, smoothly. So thank you so much. And one of the things also about this this particular project that we're doing a lane elimination, which mm -hmm. is we're testing out a, a lane repurposing. So very excited about that. Right, any questions for Stephanie before we move on to the next uh, presentation? Don't see any mm -hmm. hands raised, so thank you, Stephanie. All right, and next up is gonna be a, a quick um, update for our, our Broward MPO Tiger project. So that will be Buffy Sanders. Buffy, whenever you're ready. Can, anyone, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. My name is Buffy Sanders of Broward MPO. I'm handling the um, Tiger program. And I just want to give you a quick update. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a little history. Um, the MPO was awarded the Tiger grant in 2016, even though we applied for it in 2015. Um, but we were actually awarded it in 2016. Uh, preliminary design started in 2017 with FDOT um, handling the design and construction and the agreement was finalized in 2019 which allowed us to finally use the Tiger Fund grant. I mean the Tiger Funds. Next slide please. These are the partners that are involved, the stakeholders. Like I said, FDOT they agreed to do the design and um, construction. They also are doing a segment along power line between um, pretty much the portion in Wilton Manors and a little bit of Oakland Park that they're paying for themselves to connect uh, Power Line Road to the south. There's already been a lane elimination to the portion of Oakland Park that's gonna be a future lane elimination. Um, Broward County, of course, has been a great partner. The city of Pompano Beach, Oakland Park, Fort Lauderdale and Lauderdale Lakes. Next slide, please. This is just a, a quick breakdown of how the, um, the funds were uh, divided. It shows that we received the $11.4 million in Tiger Grant funds. Uh, local partners, our stakeholders um, came up big and gave us 36%, uh, which is a lot more than the 20% uh, that is usually required for matching funds. They came in with, the, like I said, the 36%. The state for that segment on, on Power Line Road they're paying 642,000. And then the MPO itself was able to um, contribute 1.4, 1.5 um, million of their attributed dollars to help cover some of the overrun costs. The total, the total project as of right now is $21.45 million. Next slide, please. This is a quick location to show how the, 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 the projects, um, how the project completion of the project shows a network of what we've been working on so far. As you can see the, in yellow, 
those are the highlighted projects that uh, the Tiger Funds are paying for along with the uh, partners. Next slide, please. A quick schedule, like I said, the grant was signed in 2019, July of 2019, which allowed us to use the funds. We're um, and actually advertised for a design build team, which was brought on um, brought on board in, 20, um, in May of 2020, which um, completed design of 2022. We had a, our, um, a preliminary design, which was about 30% during the process of 2017 to 2019, but the actual completion of the design project was the um, design build team and they started in 2020. Construction started in 2021, April 2021 of this year, and the construction is slated to end for all five projects in September 2022. Um, next slide, please. This is just a quick snapshot of the projects. Uh, this is Powerline Road, where we're gonna be re, uh, repurposing a lane, the outside lane from, um, it's gonna go from six lanes back to four, with um, bulb outs, landscaping bulb outs on, in the bike lane area. It's gonna be a seven foot bike lane, buffer bike lane. And it's the limits are from Commercial Boulevard to Oakland Park Boulevard. Next slide, please. Martin Luther King Boulevard or Hammondville, I don't know how, um, some people might know it. Um, it's gonna be another seven foot bike lane but it's gonna be achieved by widening it within the median. Um, there's gonna be actual pedestrian lighting for this segment. And there's gonna be some um, decorated color sidewalks that they're um, is having installed as well, which is gonna be um, similar to what Pompano is trying to achieve to the um, Eastern side of the um, corridor. There's also gonna be landscaping with this uh, project and the limits for this project is um, just west of 95. 95 overpass to Power Line Road. Next segment, please. Um, North Force 31st Avenue is going to be a, a, between a four and five foot lane um, bike lane that's going in this corridor. Um, it's pretty much based on the available right of way that we can um, achieve. So we try to do as, as, as biggest lane as possible. There are some areas where it goes down to four lanes. Um, with this project, besides the bike lane, they're going to be um, installing mast arms that the county is on um, provided. And then, um, oh, and, and that's pretty much it for this one, I'm sorry. Um, next slide, please. Riverland Road, Riverland, this segment is pretty much bro um, broken up into two segments. There's Riverland Road from um, State Road 7 to Davie Boulevard and then Southwest 27th from Davie Boulevard to Brown Boulevard. The Riverland Road section is gonna be a four foot bike lane with a one foot shared buffer. Um, we're adding a five foot um, sidewalk to the north of the roadway. And this one, we're adding a little extra technology by installing um, illuminated RPMs within the buffer of the, um, the within the buffer to allow um, um, for the light up the roadway, not the roadway, but to allow for, allow for um, sorry, to allow for a better uh, visualization of the bikers within this corridor. Next slide, please. The other portion is Southwest 27th, where we'll be uh, repurposing a, a lane, an outside, uh, the outside lane on both sides. And it's gonna be a five foot buffer, I mean, a five foot bike lane with a three foot buffer on this corridor. Um, the center lane is gonna remain the same, but it's gonna be widened to 14 feet and um, also, the illuminated RPMs will be installed as well within this corridor. Next slide, please. The last project is the Lauderdale Greenway. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with this one. This segment is, is pretty much filling in the a missing gap um, from 31st Avenue to 29th Avenue. It's right in there. It's going to be a 0.26. But this one, we're going to be adding ped pe 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 lighting, landscaping, and irrigation within this corridor. Um, the first three projects I mentioned are scheduled to be finished in February of next year, with the following, the last two segments being done within before se the end of September. Uh, next segment, please. Next slide. Um, that's it for my uh, quick presentation. Are there any questions?
you have any questions for Buffy, please raise your, your virtual hand. Buffy, I don't see any questions. Uh, oh, there is a question. Uh, Paul, please go ahead. Um, well, I just had a question about the Lauderdale um, Greenway. Is that what cities are those? Are those Lauderdale Lakes? Is that is that the, the mission? The the, the missing portion is in Lauderdale Lakes. The Greenway extends from um, pretty much a portion in Oakland Park Boulevard and, and, and Lauderdale Lakes together. Oh, okay, okay. I think I remember um, Gary way back in the day talking about that. Yeah, you're yeah. correct. That's the missing segment. It's like a big yeah. gap in the in the yeah. way. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we have a question, uh, Larry. Yeah, thanks, Ricardo. Uh, hey, Buffy, good presentation. Just curious about the uh, illuminated RPMs. Is that going to be the same or very similar uh, internal illuminated RPMs that was along Winston Park Boulevard and Coconut Creek, if you're familiar with that at all? Winston Park Boulevard between Lions and uh, and 441. I'm not. I'm not. Steve Ricardo is shaking Robert. his head. Yeah, so, yeah, but Ricardo's shaking his head. Yes. So it, if it is, then we may want to touch base with the city of Coconut Creek to see if there's any lesson learned from that project. Um, I used to live in that area, so just want to just. Um, I think it's a great concept. I think it should be used on state roads, but I. I this is great concept with using it on. Riverland and Southwest 27. So just want to make sure it's a, su a successful project. And if it there's anything we can do to help, let us know. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. I, I believe so. I believe that the same technology, that these are solar illum internal illuminated RPMs. I believe are the same ones that you guys are using uh, on, um, in, in Coconut Creek. Okay. Great. Thanks, more Ricardo. Questions. One more question, Buffy, from Christopher. Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, the power line road uh, bike lanes, those are protected bike lanes? There, there will be buffered bike lanes, but the, the, um, the landscape and bubble house are actually on the right hand side of the, the uh, bike lane. So we had to, um, per DOT standards, the, the, the um, bubble house are allowed only on the right hand side of the road. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, they, they are buffered as per FDOT standards, they are. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Um, let me see, I don't think, I don't think we have any more questions. All right, thank you, Buffy, great presentation. I, I, you know, I just, I, you know, you, you guys have been hearing a lot about lay elimination, lane repurposing. I just don't want you to think that's the only thing that we do here. It is one of the many, many strategies that we can do to implement complete streets. All right, next thing, next, we'll get right into the next presentation. And this is by Larry Wallace, our Bicycle Pedestrian, Co uh, Pedestrian Completions Coordinator at FDOT. He's gonna give us a quick demo of uh, a very exciting uh, website uh, uh, that they put together to show um, what a potential complete street can look like in a, on a stakeholder. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen, Larry. I think I'm gonna, we're gonna okay. give you control. Yeah, thanks, Ricardo. Uh, let's see here, share screen. And we're used to Teams here in uh, DOT, but let's see, share. And let's see, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks again, Ricardo. My name is Larry Wallace. I'm with uh, FDOT District 4. And I'm here to share some exciting news about the new uh, Florida Complete Streets uh, website. Um, this is a public facing website. Um, and this is for the entire state. This is not just for District 4. Um, this is for the entire state of Florida. And this was uh, built by Central Office in Tallahassee. And so it was owned and operated uh, by um, Central Office. And so if the server goes down, it's not District 4, uh, it, it'll be in Central Office in Tallahassee. But um, this was um, a, a huge um, expo, I want to say at the Sashto, right, Ricardo, I think you were at that conference. Um, they had a, a big exhibit room and showcased this uh, Complete Streets website, so I'm here to share this with you, and I think Dwayne Carver did that presentation at the Sashto, and 
um, forward the presentation over to me, and I'm just would like to share this uh, over to the to the CSAC. So with that, um, I'd like to share this video. It's about two minutes and change, two minutes eleven seconds. Ricardo, do we have time for the video, or should we just skip over uh, into the? Um, no, we do, we do, Larry. If you if you don't mind, I don't know if we can hear it though, but let's let's see if we if it works. Let's see if I hit play, and if we don't hear it, then we'll skip it. Okay, let's see. Hopefully it works. Can y'all hear it? Unfortunately, no, you have to no. uh, share the sound as well. I can share it myself if you wish. Yeah, that would be great. Thank right. you. Fantastic. So I'll stop sharing then. And then maybe if you want, we could, after it's on video, we can just keep it on your screen and screen. then I can just do the next slide and stuff. Florida leads in complete streets and has for decades. Nearly 40 years ago, we became the second state in the nation to pass legislation ensuring that routes for biking and walking were considered in all road construction projects. Since then, FDOT officially adopted our complete streets policy, recognizing that complete streets are context sensitive and formally incorporated this approach into our official design manual in 2018. Our state's population, environment, and topography are diverse and each location requires its own customized solution. Florida's approach to complete streets celebrates this diversity and affirms our robust 360 degree commitment to enhancing safety and mobility for all. We rebuild after coastal hurricane damage and prioritize pedestrian safety along with increased resiliency. We use urban resurfacing projects as an opportunity to upgrade ADA facilities enhance pedestrian safety, and build bike-friendly cycle track systems. We partner with communities to provide curb extensions with reconfigured on-street parking, extra-wide sidewalks, and highly visible pedestrian crossings. Florida consistently integrates Complete Streets concepts into our projects, improving safety, enhancing mobility, and inspiring innovation. We're broadening the possibilities of how and where we apply Complete Streets principles. And we're expanding the definition and inclusivity of what Complete Streets is and should be. We're launching new immersive and interactive ways to learn about Complete Streets and how they can benefit our state. From local safety projects to exciting new corridors, we're doing it all. The future of Complete Streets is here in Florida. Visit flcompletestreets.com to learn more. Yeah, thanks Ricardo for sharing that. I guess if you wanna just keep it still on your screen, it's, it's fine and then we can just go through it together if that's all right. I, if, if that works for you, Larry, I think. Yeah, that, that, Rebecca, that's fine. Sharing the screen, you can let her know. Rebecca, is that okay with you? We can can we share your screen? Oh, I just closed it. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I can go back now that I'm. Yeah, you can go back. Have there. it up and running here. Okay, great. So yeah, I guess I forgot to mention the the name of the website is flcompletestreets.com. So fl abbreviates for Florida completestreets.com, and uh, we'll just move on to the. Um, the history of the complete trees. And I thought the, the video did a great job outlining the history and showcasing a lot of the resiliency and adaptiveness of today's modern approach of complete streets. Um, so this tab showcases the history of the complete streets and um, you know how it began in 1984 and all the way through through current stages and how it's integrated into the Florida design manual. And so of course the why. So why complete streets? Um, increases safety, mobility, connectivity, and reach quality of life, economic development. And the Broward MPO, you guys do a great job too in indicating on your website as well um, for Complete Streets and the Complete Streets guidebook as well. Um, and then here's like the, from uh, Secretary Tebolt, the proclamation of Complete Streets. And moving on to this 360 degree approach, um, which I thought was a really good, um, you know, logo and um, approach to 360 degrees, how each project is going to 
evaluate and try to incorporate complete streets into every project, which is great. Um, policy of planning. And then um, this is really great to, to read up about. And these have different links here. So you have a complete streets map. Um, so you can check on some of these projects that are nearby into your local local community. And again, like I said, it's statewide. So if you're interested in any other districts as well. Um, and then you can see there's some of the featured projects you have a couple here in, or one here in, um, in district four, the city of Hollywood, the young circle. And, and I think that touches base on the 360 degree approach tab. And now the Explorer tool, this is the most enhanced tool of them all, I think, in for the website. It showcases for complete streets as well as context classification. So if we click on hover over C1 natural and you click on, this is a key thing, you have to hit this blue little arrow button here. <clears throat> so now I'll start focusing on each context class and it shows you like an existing condition and gives you different mockups and concepts. So if you do like a current standard, it can show some off, um, it's like a rest stop and then additional examples showing like some sort of uh, pathway. Example number two, showing a mid-block crossing. So additional approaches you can do in a C1 context class. C2, same thing it'll do. So C2 and then existing condition, maybe a current design standard with some uh, right turn lane with buffer bike lane. And I think if you hover over it, it shows you so some examples. Um, example one, maybe an additional right turn lane with some uh, some guardrail and then a potential roundabout, C2T, current standard, other examples. So it's really interactive. Um, I won't spend too much more time on it, but you kind of get the gist of it. C3R, just show you some of the proposed conditions with shared use path and some mid block crossings. C3C, which is C3 commercial. Showing you possible of a separated bicycle facility here with a cycle track and buffer bike lanes. We'll just do a few more here. C4 urban general. Showing the potential of a protected intersection with the green colored markings. And C5 is you get into the urban center. Showing more of the protected intersection and cycle track potentially. And there's your protected intersections with your curb returns. And then C6, your urban core environments. More of your separated bicycle facilities, which these have configurations. So really great tool, very interactive. Um, shows more about context class and what it's potentially used for. Um, next one is the resources. This is great too. Uh, Complete Streets policy, videos and webinars, brochures, connect ped, there's another GIS database. Um, there's the FDM design manual, lean repurposing guidebook, content classification guidebook, bus training. So a lot of great resources on here and it's little documents. So as these uh, documents and publications get updated, um, it'll be updated on the website and as more get added, it'll be added to the website. So I thought this was a great tool. And lastly is the coordinator. So myself in district four, um, I'm here, maybe they'll add a picture of myself here. And that basically does it, Ricardo. At this point in time, I'll open up to any questions. We do have a few Menti questions if, if that's been uploaded, but at this point in time, I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. I think I think I have a question, but I think let's go to Menti first. I think okay. we have a question first. Uh, Stephanie, if you can share that, that out. The question that yes. we had for Larry. Uh, yes, I will start sharing my screen. Larry, if you can uh, stop sharing your screen. Thank you. You're welcome. And we're going to the first question of Mentimeter. So the first question is, what other features would you like to be added on the Capricious website? And we have already some Recommendations. So we have community member highlights, existing guidelines, 
school participation highlights, update progress on safety performance, that's a good one. Interactive Google Street View or maps. Let's see, maybe the green book or other typical plans or run applications in one place. <laughs> that's a good one too. A brief narrative. Okay, that one was fast. <laughs> Let's see. About how freight vehicles fit into computer street environment. Any 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 responses, uh, Larry, about the suggestions? These are all great. I see that they're all still mm -hmm. coming in. Um, but you can compile a list for me, Stephanie, and, mm -hmm. and, and shoot them email yeah. to me. And remember, this is owned and operated by mm -hmm. uh, Central Office. Um, so any suggestions, of course, would will have to be su suggested and submitted to central office for addition. But uh, Green Book, I saw there, um, state of Florida, especially for on system, utilizes the FDM. So Green Book would be off system, but definitely a good suggestion. Um, school participation, those are all great. Maybe we can add a resource for um, state of Florida school. I think that's that's a good resource to use. Mm -hmm. um, existing guidelines, I think for Utilizing FDM, you can go in the FDM and, and see the previous manual, such as the plans preparation manual. Um, that might be good to have a link to there. Um, maybe even the Broward MPO Complete Streets Guidebook could be uh, something we can add in there too. Ricardo, what do you think? That's, a, that's <laughs> an excellent idea. Excellent yeah, idea. no, I thought it was a great showcase of this website. Um, it's a mm -hmm. very enhanced since the the last Complete Streets website was almost like a you know, like almost like a shared drive almost. So a lot of enhancements, as you can see, is a mm -hmm. big push from central office um, to each district coordinator for push for complete streets and separated bike facilities and wider sidewalks and mid block crossings and bulb extensions. And, you know, so um, we're looking forward, FDOT working with our partners on trying to enhance uh, these projects and provide more for mobility and even micro mobility now too, right? With tactical urbanism, Stephanie. And uh, mm -hmm. so I think this is, this is great. And maybe even a drop, but I was thinking more for my comment with the central office was even a suggestion box um, to okay. potential projects. Um, and I'm not sure if that was on there too, as part of the Mentimeter, but that was something I came up with, but no. these are all great. I think they're still coming in. Oh, this is great. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I think keep, keep them coming. Don't, it's important to incorporate freight. It's been mentioned twice. Yeah. And that's something that we also uh, 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 talk about in one of the Safe Street Summits, you know, how we incorporate freight into computer streets. And that's a question that I think uh, it's not easy to respond, but yeah. I think we have to start looking at it now. And DOT, we need DOT's, uh, you know, right. points of view ab about that. And so, uh, there's yeah. another one, reference local guidelines. I think that's key because, you know, working with DOT and, and, and the locals, right? How we make sure that, you know, to incorporate also local guidelines into the design of our streets. You know, every city is different. So I think, uh, yeah, that's important. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I echo that, uh, Larry, because yeah. you guys are still doing some off-system projects. You know, maybe the green book, some local guidelines could be also an additional tool there. So that's definitely mm -hmm. uh, a good a good suggestion there. I do have a question for you, Larry, about the protected sure. intersection. Love to see one of those implemented somewhere. Is there any plans? Have you guys identified a potential um, location for that? Or are you still on the planning stages on that? Yes, planning stages, Ricardo. Um, there is an internal task team evaluating potential uh, candidates for protected intersections. Um, you know, there's a, it's a big push also from central office to try to see if we could, we meaning FDOT could in, provide a protected intersection in the state of Florida. Um, there's some internal discussions on funding and schedule and all that stuff too. So more to be discussed, but yes, there are, discussions at this time, what I can say. Um, but yeah, I, I think all those suggestions are great. Um, and those uh, ideas, Ricardo, about the Green Book, you're right, we do local agency plans and lap projects and C-slips. So yeah, maybe the, maybe the Green Book is not a bad idea to, to add that to, to as a part of a resource. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I see a lot too for Street View. So there was um, for interactive map, um, one of the tabs. So maybe I can suggest if you click on one of those projects, it could zoom you in to, uh, to the, pro the limits of the project and have the ability for street level view or at the, at the also connect ped. Um, if, you're not, if you didn't see that um, resource as well, you can click on connect ped and that'll also provide you to a GIS map that the limits of the project and use street view from there. Perfect. One of the things, uh, you know, I, I forgot to put the link here, but I was, please, like members, I will share the link to that website uh, to, with you uh, to, with you guys, because, uh, yeah, you can play around with it, you see see how you like it. I think there's a lot of good information there regarding what the is doing for complete streets. So um, I will we'll definitely share that, that information with you guys. Uh, any more questions for Larry before we move on? I don't think we have any more questions. Larry, thank you for a great presentation, great demo. I, I use that website quite a bit. That's and great. Be, you know, next thing, I want to see some green bike lanes and stair roads. I think that would be fantastic. We're starting to see some data, so I'm hoping that will be the next thing. All right. Our next presentation is by our very own Paul Flavian. He's the data services manager here at the Bard MPO. He's going to give you a demonstration of our performance measure measures dashboard. So Paul, when you when you have a moment, uh, yep. I'll start sharing my screen so you can share yours. All right. Thank you, Ricardo. Good afternoon, all. Uh, Paul Flavian, Broward MPO, Data Services Manager here at the MPO. And can you guys see my screen? All right, awesome. You will notice that it's a beautiful new website. Actually, that's been updated as well. So just wanted to show you how you actually get to our uh, performance measure dashboard. You will get here to the M MPO website. You will go to the tab under resources, data and tools. You will scroll down to performance measures dashboard. You will click on that and you will see this lovely picture and scroll down. You could actually either click on the picture or where it says click here. I will click here and it takes you to the dashboard. Now, what I will tell you is this dashboard was developed back in 2018. And essentially it, it came um, after um, all of the regulations came down from FHWA and FTA about, we had to essentially do performance measures, set targets, uh, some of them on a yearly basis, others on a you know, more or less regular basis. So one of the ways that uh, the MPO thought that we could sort of uh, share the information about these performance measures is to build a dashboard. And we actually used a, a company called My Sidewalk to actually build this out. And what, the, what I need to tell you is that when we were working with this company, we, we literally, we built this from the ground up. And what you see here is essentially version three of this dashboard. And also I should tell you, at this point, there's other MPOs that are actually using um, variations of this dashboard as well. So with that, I will, uh, go through the, the demo. Now, again, you look in the tabs here. The first page you'll see is it essentially talks a little bit about the broad MPO, who we are, what we do, and things like that. And then you have state of the system. Um, that page essentially talks about broad transportation system. And if you, you know, just a few statistics about, you know, um, and all those statistics are coming from uh, the American Community Survey, five-year data, you know, about Broward zero car households and things like that. One of the real, very, very cool things about this dashboard, anytime you see a map or any sort of um, data, you can actually download it. All you do is go to this, the, these little bars here, you click on it. You could either download it as a GIS and if it's, um, you know, data, you know, like this is zero car households, you can actually um, download the GIS or you can allow, download a CSV, which allows you to do your own data as well. One of the other things you could do is you can export this actual um, map or picture and then just insert it as a JPEG or something or PNG, no, sorry, as a PNG into a presentation that you, you can do. So it's, it's, a very, it's very cool. Second, um, going down the left side of the tab again is a scorecard. If you just wanted to go here and see how is the broad MPO doing in terms of performance measures? You will click on a scorecard and you can scroll down, you know, safety. Now this is overall safety on all roadways in Broward, right? Every roadway 
interstates, materials, local roads, all the whole thing. Um, again, infrastructure condition, which is another performance measure. This talks about um, bridge and pavement conditions as, yeah, bridge and pavement conditions. And then system reliability, which is essentially about travel time reliability on the interstate and also on the non-interstate national highway system roadways. Um, transit asset management and in transit safety. Again, if you just wanted a quick snapshot of how we're doing and all the performance measures, you go here to scorecard, you scroll down, you see how we're doing. Now, if you wanted a more in-depth view of these uh, performance measure areas, I'll just click on infrastructure condition for, for now. That takes you to that page. And again, it starts with a narrative about, you know, what it is, what, what, what we're measuring in, in, in marking as far as performance measure. And it also has a map. Now, this is a bridge of map conditions in Broward. Every bridge in Broward, you could scroll over it. It tells you what conditions and it's good, poor, or fair. Right. Also, you can download this. You can get the CSV that gives you all of the bridges, locations, and things like that. Or you could download it as a you know as a GeoJSON file, which allows you to put it into a GIS and do you know whatever you want to do your, your own analysis. Or you can export again as a, a PNG. We have bridge conditions, pavement conditions. Um, also, we have these, you know, the data in this way. One of the things that we did with this performance measure dashboard, we wanted to like um, a lot of these target areas, we wanted to measure ourselves against um, the MPOs to the north and to the south of us because essentially we're all one urbanized area. It's just we have three different MPOs. So if you just wanted to look at Broward, for example, here, you could just click on this blue button here and remove Miami and remove Palm Beach, and you could see how Broward is doing. Uh, one of the things I need to mention, all of the data that we, most of the data you see here on as far as the performance measures, we get through agreement from the Department of Transportation on a yearly basis to provide a safety data, bridge and pavement data, and also the system performance data. Now, as far as the transit uh, performance measures, we get those from our uh, transit partners, SFRTA, BCT, um, some from the TMA as well. Um, so just to you know give you that idea now i know for this group i wanted to spend a little bit more time not necessarily on you know system performance or or, or bridging pavement or, or transit i'll spend more time on safety because essentially complete streets safety is a big component of that right so we'll go on to the safety page here yeah we have a map here it's essentially, it's a heat map of all the crashes, crashes in Broward. One of the things you can do, you could go in and zoom in on all those crashes. We also what developed, um, just think last year, last year or a year before we developed the high injury network. Essentially, that shows you where we have more than, I think it's like two or more fatalities or serious injuries. Now, we developed this high injury network for both all crashes and also for just pet and bike crashes, which I'll show you um, further down on this page. Now, again, you could go in, zoom in. You could just click anywhere you want. Oops, sorry. Tells you here, 19 serious crashes on this segment of road on, in South Hayes Road. So again, all of this data, you can click here, download as a CSV, which essentially Excel, download as a GIS, or again, export as a picture. And you could just click this and it goes back to the regular um, map of Broward. And like I told you guys before, oh, we have all the you know data for fatalities and things like that. What, another caveat I should add, our current data is up to 2019. Again, it's data that we received from FDOT. And the most current data that we should have, well, they will be providing us soon is up to 2020. 
So that data will be real interesting because as you know, we had a major essentially shutdown of everything and everywhere. So it'll be interesting to see how, you know, our five-year averages, you know, how that average affects that and, and things like that. Now on this here, you, you can see for fatalities, you see a five-year average, or if you want to see this, the by year data, we have it all the way out to 2000, from 2006. So again, you can see all those data points. Again, you just want to see Broward, see Broward. You can just download it if you want, CSV, picture, however you want. Crash rates, and again, as I told you before, we also have this high injury network for bike and ped only. And here you have it. You can go in, click. Oops, hang on. Where am I? Oh. Ah, there we go. Bike bed crashes tells you, you know, you had a fatality, you had six um, serious injuries for bike and bed. And this is on State Highway 838 in Plantation. So again, one of the things, I, other thing I should tell you is um, we're actually using the high injury network at the MPO and um, our criteria for C-slip as well as the complete street, not, well, not C-slip and as well as uh, we also used it. Okay, oh, master plan. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so uh, also the mobility hubs. A lot of the um, grant programs, essentially, that we're in the MPO, we're using the high injury network as one of the criteria, essentially, the safety criteria to help flesh out those areas that we you actually want to spend MPO attributable funds on. So, and I think with that, um. I'm done unless there are any questions, Ricardo. Which again, this is a great tool, and it, it, it we specifically built it for, you know, to share it with our TAC, our CAC, and of course the public. Again, it's every year we we'll, we we'll update it. We usually update it towards the latter end of the year after we get all the data from FDOT and and all the new targets have been adopted. But yeah, so feel free to go in again. You go to resources data and tools, performance measure dashboard, and enjoy. Yeah. That I'm done, Ricardo. Thank you, Paul, great presentation. And I guess, you know, I guess the SEC members, I will, we will also send you a, a direct link to the uh, performance dashboard so you can come take a good look at what's going on. And, and Paul, just a quick question for you. Is mm -hmm. the, the crash information or the crash data or is it trending down up or staying from what you've seen um, with the latest information that you have, I know it's 2019, but what, you know, what is it? Is it, is it are, we, are we doing things better or just are we not meeting our, our, our targets here? Can you still see my screen? This is the yearly data from 2006 to 2019. Yeah, it's sort of, yeah, it's sort of all over the place. You know, and, and you know, if you'll notice here, like back in 2008 and nine, we had, you know, the financial meltdown, you sort of see a trend down a little bit. And then as the recovery happened, it sort of started to go back up and pick back up. But I'm, I'm fairly sure 2020 will, def, will show a dip. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just, it will depend how big that dip is. And again, this is annual data, but so we kind of smooth it out with the, with the five-year average data. So all these data points here, like this one is from 09 to 13, 10, 2010 to 2014, up to out here, which is 2015 to 2019, which I think we had like 222 um, crashes and um, fatalities, or, sorry, between mm -hmm. that five year period. But you know, if you look at the five year data from 2017, 2018, and 2019, yeah, it's kind of on a, on a rise. Yeah. You know? Okay. But, but again, we hadn't really really fully started the, all the measures that we're doing. We, the Complete Streets projects, the safety um, um, projects that we're doing, all of those things all hadn't kicked in yet. So we'll probably be seeing the fruits of that labor bearing out you know, further down the road. But again, this is what 
told us, hey, we have to do something, right? Yep, yep, I think so. Thank you so much, Paul. And sure. the last thing I wanted to ask you, I think the scorecards, you can also do them by city, if I'm not mistaken. Is that is that a possibility? The scorecard? Yeah, no, this is like overall, yeah. This overall. is, yeah, this is overall, yeah. Okay, perfect, thank you, Paul. Any questions for Paul? Don't see any hands raised. Thank you, Paul. Great presentation. Um, my pleasure. All right, let me see if I start sharing my screen again. Actually, give me one second here. I can see this. All right. I guess you can, can you guys see my screen now? I would imagine yes. Yes. Yes, thank you. All right, our next questions for Paul. Uh, the next presentation is uh, by Karen Werfel. She's the transportation planning program manager at the city of Fort Lauderdale. This is about the project that actually it's included in our Tiger Grant. Uh, I think Buffy Sanders spoke to a little bit about this project early, earlier. Uh, so Karen's gonna give you an overall presentation on how they were able to include this project as part of our Tiger Grant and especially, you know, emphasizing how important it is to get the community engaged. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Karen. You just let me know when you want me to move to the next slide. Or do you have it in a format that will work? Let me see. Oh. Or do you want me to share? Um, I, no, I, got, I think it will work. Oh, did you have, did you have cool. any animations or? Nope, that works. Okay, perfect. Awesome, thank you. So I'll try to wrap it all together of all the previous presentations that we heard, uh, dive down deeper into our Riverland Road project and how it came about and how we work with the community on creating this complete street. Next slide. Riverland Road is located in the southwest corner of Fort Lauderdale. It connects to State Route 7 on the west, left of your picture, and Davie Boulevard to the north. And you'll see it's located in pretty close proximity to both the interchange on 95 for Davie Boulevard and 595 on State Route 7. So it, it does experience um, cut through and collector movements through this neighborhood. Go ahead, next slide. The existing conditions are two 12 foot travel lanes, a sidewalk on one side, um, the north or the west side of the road as it loops around. In some portions, there are sidewalks on both sides. There's a pretty significant landscape canopy that's extremely important to the neighborhood in this area. And the overall length of this segment is 2.5 miles. Next slide. So to get into a little bit of background, this is a pretty complicated project and how it has um, woven through where we are today. To add to the complication, there are three different roadway jurisdictions on this two and a half miles. We have to the west is DOT as it's related to State Route 7. Then there's county jurisdiction, then city, and then county again. That portion that is the city in gray was most recently annexed into the city of Fort Lauderdale in 2002. So we have three different roadway jurisdictions and we have more than nine neighborhood associations along this corridor. The white area on the neighborhood map is not associated, they're not collectively into associations. However, they are organized regarding the preservation of the tree canopy in the area. So there's nine formal, but there's others as well that we've had to work with through this corridor. Go ahead. So where we've come since um, 2015 really is when my department started working with the neighborhood. There was money through the annexation process, 700,000 that was dedicated to improving the roadway. Um, so we started working with the residents of the corridor specifically back in 2015, just the portion that was city of Fort Lauderdale jurisdiction. Um, we did some data collection in partnership with the county. We did some collection ourselves many site visits with the residents to understand what was going on. And we did a series of three public meetings in person to really understand what people were looking for and what the challenges were in this corridor and understand what some of the solutions could be. 
Okay, next. Part of the data collection and what we found um, was there really did experience a spike in volume. We heard it anecdotally, but we saw it through the data. Um, in 2016, when Waze really came about, they did experience that cut through between State Route 7 and Davie. Um, there definitely were speeding issues with our traffic counts that we saw. There was a crash issue as well, 204 crashes on the segment between the, the last five years, the most recent period. And there was a lack of multimodal accommodations. And you can see there was a great Google Street View of the curve on Riverland Road where you see people biking and walking all on that sidewalk, um, which this portion is actually five foot, but a lot of the other portions are less than that sub-adequate. So people you know, fighting for the same space to try to do their multimodal because it's not safe on the roadway with the speeding and the volumes that are happening there. So then to add to that, they also experience flooding, both aerial and tidal, um, especially in this bend pictured here, but also even further north at 14th Street, closer to Davie, um, due to the close proximity of the river. Go ahead. Next slide, please. So we dove down deeper into some of the data to really understand better what was happening. We work with streetlight data and they have um, you know, Bluetooth information from your phones and different apps that you have on your phones and they track. And it's not complete numbers, but it is um, trend and percentages of what's happening. So they looked at the 2014-15 data and cars that were traveling on State Route 7 south of Riverland Road and cars that went through a point on Davie Boulevard east of Riverland Road and then put a point in the middle at 31st and to track what percentage of those cars from the endpoints pass through either Riverland Road or on Davie Boulevard. So back in 2014-15, only 12% of the trips traveling through went on Riverland Road. But then you can see on the right by 2018, it's not just anecdotal, those numbers more than doubled the percentage of cars that were cutting through on Riverland Road. And then we dove down even deeper to understand, was it time of day? And it definitely, we saw almost 30% in the evening peak were cutting through on Riverland Road. So there, they definitely had an issue and it definitely increased um, from 2016 to 2018. Okay, next slide. Karen, did you have a question here? I meant to meet a question right after this slide or the next one? I don't remember where they were. I'm sorry. I had two different ones, right? I don't know which one you went with. Stephanie, which question do we have for? for... About traffic counts. We can ask it at the end, mm -hmm. Karen. We'll okay. That. Sure. Next one. Next one. So then to talk a little bit more about our approach on community engagement, I said we did three um, in-person meetings pre-COVID to understand what the challenges are, just writing all over maps, um, stickies and dots of people who agreed with those comments, where, where the issues were. Um, also, we really look, we try to separate as much as we can of tell us what the issues are and then tell us the types of treatments that you might like um, and try to separate people from coming to the conclusion of what the solution is. Um, it's difficult and doesn't always happen, but so on the right, you'll see a poster board from my group session that people put green dots on the elements that they liked and red on what they didn't. Most of the people liked the elements that were listed on this, optical bars, speed tables, um, the in-ground RPMs, but didn't really feel like the mixed for the gateway features on these elements. Mm -hmm. Next. And then in the middle, when we were full steam ahead, moving forward, we had money to do traffic calming. Um, there was development pressure, and you'll see this from a sticky from one of that, the map that was previous, that a, there was a potential party who was going to subdivide a large portion at the corner into 13 new lots and houses. There were concerns about access and egress at the curve. Um, so our efforts kind of got put on hold until something got figured out there. The neighborhoods and the associations in that area work together to advocate to protect that parcel of land. It is now um, the Riverland Preserve. It's a park and park space. So they moved that one forward and they um, saved that lot. 
And then now we are back on track for our traffic calming and other efforts. Um, next slide. So we knew like the long-term project was gonna take a while and you know, we started in 2015, but there were things that we could do in the short term and try to mitigate some of the concerns that residents were having that were on the lower cost end. So you see an example here, we used our parking enforcement department to help us with some installations, just curve warning signs. And we work with the county on um, other measures at the curve, the different curves and how we can improve the signage. We added speed radar signs as well as motion activated curve warning signs. You'll see that one glowing in the background to help. This is you know, a darker curve and this is where we've seen some of the crashes and off-road off incidents happening. Um, we've also done targeted enforcement throughout the last five years. This is just an example of last year's most recent enforcement. And the police, the beginning was COVID period, but then it um, had a pretty significant uptick over the winter of last year into recently. So we, we try to do some short-term things while we're waiting and keep moving towards the long-term goal. Next slide. And then while we're moving, um, the Tiger opportunity came to us, as mentioned previously, the MPO was putting together this application. They wanted to see if we had any projects that might be viable for what their overall goal was. We had a few that we presented, but this one was the one that fit into the overall project. You see the E, the yellow kind of arm in the bottom and how it connects to the whole region. Their focus was really bike lanes and sidewalks. So those pieces of the overall project fit in, but the drainage and the traffic calming didn't fit into the project that they were looking to do. So we still needed to find other opportunities for those elements. And then overall, the city contributed over a million dollars towards this um, segment of the Tiger project. Next slide. And this is to dive down a little bit deeper into what the cross section is that Buffy talked about. So we're reducing the lane widths on Riverland Road to 10 feet. We're adding four foot bike lanes by widening slightly and there's a one foot buffer. Um, this is an example of our collaboration and working together as all our partners, MPO, DOT, the county and the city. You know, the city preferred to have five foot bike lanes. The county preferred to have 11 foot roads, and we kind of negotiated to the middle of where that one foot is kind of shared between the two different uses of the bike lane and the roadway. And then adding um, sidewalk, making sure it's five, at least five foot sidewalk through the whole corridor on one side of that. Okay, next. And I wanted to share that you know, it was a challenge, the cross section combined with the tree mitigation um, as I mentioned, the trees were extremely important to the residents. Um, this was a design build. And when the preliminary design build plans were released and people saw it going through all the trees on the road, there was an uproar and everybody freaking out. I see Ricardo shaking his head. We had to have another meeting to calm folks down, um, say that wasn't it. And Greg intervened and helped us with that conversation and commitment to do the best we could to mitigate loss of trees. They did a great job. The DOT did a great job, their designers, in mitigating that. Um, you know, the, even the numbers seem a little high, but they're really not. The 14 palm trees and 10 hardwood, they are tiny little kind of sad looking trees that are not healthy are the ones that are being removed. And some that are half dead. Um, a large portion of the, I think six out of 10 of the hardwoods are around the bridge that's on this corridor and they're impacting the bridge structure and utilities. So they need to be removed anyways. And then you know, the project is mitigating per the city code, um, the landscape impacts. And that would mean eight palm trees are being installed and 20 foot hard, 24 hardwood trees. Uh, we use the same method and approach with our neighborhoods that are very involved and the leaders from all of the HOAs were invited to participate and we had a good crowd of each of those meetings that we've had of where can we put trees, which trees are the right trees in the right place that will be healthy and make sense in those future conditions. Um, we had several meetings to kind of get to that final scope and together we created the plan for the mitigation. And you'll see here the, the two main places, they definitely wanted street trees, they didn't want it in parks. Um, there's a church on the, the north, the top picture there 
where the swale is actually being increased with the project and the sidewalks being shifted back. So we're able to add trees. That was the number one neighborhood. Everybody agreed that that was the location that needed trees most. Um, and then the south, it, which is like the 35th area. Again, really wide swale already existing and we'll be adding some more trees there. And then the palms will be added to the parks if we need to put them there or them somewhere else. So it was a great experience working with everybody. Everybody's committed and through it, our arborist has agreed to actually look for additional funding to leverage the initial work to add more street trees on this corridor. So it has been a great process. Next slide. So I mentioned the traffic calming couldn't be part of the tiger. So we needed to find additional funding for that element. Um, we were, it really was community driven throughout this whole process. The district commissioner has been very involved and committed to finding a solution for the neighbor's concerns here. Um, it's been pretty high profile. So we were able to um, beg, borrow and steal some money from other projects to get design funding and the CIP started last fiscal year. So we're in that design now. We've had two public meetings really to identify locations first um, and then design will come of those. We started with all the previous input and reiterated that we were doing, using all that previous input as our baseline. And then did we hear you right? Or is there anything else? Um, so it's gone very well. We've had great turnout virtually for these two as they've been during COVID. Next slide. So this is our traffic calming plan. And we did an effort to try to kind of space it out to be evenly throughout the whole corridor. It is a long corridor. The main elements are raised intersections at key locations um, that we heard from the community are issues, as well as where crashes are happening. Raising the existing, there's signalized pedestrian mid-block crossings. So raising those mid-block crossings to add additional traffic calming. And then on the far west side, the Tiger Project's putting in a crossing where there is a sidewalk gap um, due to some the drainage features over there. But so we are able to get the crossing in with the Tiger Project, but there's no refuge for that crossing in the middle of that straightaway. So this project will come in after and add a median pedestrian refuge to the crossing that the Tiger Project is coming in. And on the right is examples from recent project that we did with a previous TAP project on old Dixie Highway with raised intersections and raised crosswalks um, on old Dixie Highway. Okay, next slide. And really that has been what everybody wants in our community, old Dixie Highway. So then again, like, you know, the overall story is it's complicated and twisted along this path. Again, um, stop, wait in a minute. I'm sure all of you with cities have been hearing about the school parent drop off and pickup impacts this year. Um, you know, what we've heard is between the school bus driver shortage and parents not wanting to put their children on school buses, there has been a significant increase in traffic for pickup and drop off. Um, these are some examples that we've had. And, you know, know the car taking the picture on the right is not going in the wrong direction. That's cars parked in the turn lane. That's kind of flipped of the picture on the left. Cars are just blocking everything. So then parents can't get out of the school to turn right and go up 31st. Um, but because of the partnerships we've had, and you'll see in the picture in the middle, we had the school board, we had the police department, we had DOT, the contractor out there because it's gonna get ugly um, once we start tearing up the road. So how can we work together to make it a little less ugly in the short term um, and then think about long-term solutions through our traffic calming project in the end. Okay, next slide. So that's some of the highlights of the projects and lesson learned. Um, really public engagement is key. You're never gonna make everybody happy. Um, there are always gonna be people concerned, but if you track your input and get consensus on the majority of people, it helps very much. You know, we had one very strong negative person that doesn't think there's any need for traffic calming, doesn't think there's a speeding issue, doesn't think anybody was involved, but because we have all of the proof of all our public input and we've summarized every meeting and put it all together in one place so we can easily review it and just share that information with them, um, we have our support for that. And the key leaders in the community are backing the project. 
Um, overall, you can't always do everything at once. Um, the lack of traffic calming was a big hitch in this plan. Um, we had some stumbling blocks with the community on that. If you can't do traffic calming, don't put anything. So we were able to secure the money for the traffic calming, which helps smooth that over that we are committed and we'll do it um, as soon. So then now we have more support overall for the project. Um, and then, you know, from me, just having that determination to keep going and keep leveraging and um, finding the funding you need and finding what you have to do in terms of your partnerships really can make a successful project in the end as painful as it may be through some of the steps in the middle. Um, and then, you know, your collaboration and your partnerships to move that forward in a successful way. So I think that is, it. I didn't put a closing slide, but if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Ari. I I'm very familiar with this project. This is not an easy project and you guys have done a fantastic job in getting the, the buy-in that's needed, especially communicating throughout the whole process with the community and the stakeholders. So thank you so much. Do we have any questions from, uh, for Karen? You can raise your virtual hand. If not, we can go right to the Mentimeter questions. We do have one. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen, Stephanie. Yeah, so we have one question. Um, do you conduct traffic counts and crash data while developing the scope of a potential roadway project? So far we have yeses, usually yes, uh, definitely if asked by outside agencies. Yes, speed, traffic and crash data. Okay, great. It, it seems the nose were shy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Let me go ahead and share my screen again. Thank you, Karen. All right, let's go to the next presentation, the last presentation that we have for today. Uh, FDOT District 6. Keys Coast Pilot Project. Uh, Jamilet Diaz, uh, resident engineer, will give us a presentation. Jamilet, take it away. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity to present. Uh, I have enjoyed quite a bit all the presentations here today. Um, next slide, please. So, like Ricardo said, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, a project that. FDOT District 6 is deploying in Monroe County. Um, it has been named the uh, Keys Coast Project and it is a pilot at this point. Next slide. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background and then a few details on the project and uh, where we are at with this deployment. Next slide. Okay, so the project that we are deploying Keys Coast in this case, we make sure that it's consistent with the advances that the state as well as the district is trying to do in regards connected and automated vehicles. Um, so when we were developing, we looked at the guidance that has been uh, published both from uh, FDOT central office as well as federal resources and district resources as well. And I think Ricardo, if you click a few times, um, some of these will be highlighted. For example, the TSMO systems map that FDOT district six has put together our um, program action plan, the statewide uh, stamp action plan, which was just um, updated recently, as well as the connected and automated vehicle uh, business plan, among other guidance that is out there. So we make sure that we didn't start from scratch or reinvented the wheel, but rather that we looked at what is already um, established and worked on, and then we just enhance and continue uh, that same guidance. Next slide. So as you guys can see, FDOT 
um, is basically leading the state of practice uh, on connected and automated vehicle projects because we have dozens of projects that are either in planning, design, or implementation phases. And there are several others that, as you see here on this list, um, of the statewide CAB uh, map are already operational. Uh, Keys Coast, this pilot, is going to build upon the experiences that some of our partners have gained from deploying and operating um, these uh, projects that you see here. Next slide, please. So some of the background as to why we decided to do this project in Monroe County. Uh, back in 2018, FDOT had to assume operations and maintenance responsibility of all of the traffic signals and devices in Monroe County, um, everything except city of Key West at that time. And then in 2020, we assumed O&M responsibility as well of the city of Key West uh, traffic signals and devices, making it uh, be that FDOT now manages, operates, and maintains all of the state-owned uh, traffic signal infrastructure within uh, Monroe County, including City of Key West. And that happened because we used to have an agreement for uh, these local government agencies to do the operations and maintenance on behalf of the department. However, they decided to exercise um, a provision that they had, which allowed them to opt out of that agreement. And thus, you know, we began preparing to assume um, that responsibility back in 2017, actually, before the effective date of the first uh, takeover. Next slide. Sorry, I don't know, the slides are a little bit slow, at least on my end. Um, so in preparing for the transition, uh, the district made significant investments uh, in the infrastructure down in Monroe. We uh, upgraded the traffic signal system to set up communications. We also made upgrades to our Songhai TMC that you see a snapshot here. Um, the upgrades at the Songhai TMC allowed us to include arterial operations that will be overseeing the um, Monroe County system that we were about to begin um, maintaining and operating. Uh, as part of that, we also purchased a new central software or ATMS software to be able to monitor the traffic signals, which are as I said several times before now in Monroe County and our uh, Songhai TMC is here in Miami-Dade County. So we have uh, quite a distance, therefore communications and a software to be able to monitor remotely were very important. And we also very um, early on realized that we needed to have staff uh, both for operations and for maintenance that would help us um, with this new project that we're going to undertake. Next slide. Another thing that we did in preparing uh, for our takeover of the O&M was we went to the local law enforcement as well as government agencies and we developed some partnerships with them. As I said um, before, because we are in some areas up to four hours away from where our traffic signal infrastructure is, we needed to have uh, plan A, plan B, several plans in place. And one of the things that we did is we talked to both the Monroe County Sheriff's Office as well as the City of Key West Police. And we um, asked them for their assistance in some initial troubleshooting in case there was a failure of our traffic signals. And they agreed to do so since you know they're typically the first ones to respond whenever a light goes into flash or a signal goes dark, etc. Um, in exchange, we provided uh, traffic signal training for um, their selected um, deputies as well as police officers. And now what we have established is that in the event that we have uh, a failure, um, their local law enforcement agent will go to the site and then they will be on the phone with our tier operators and attempt an initial troubleshooting that many times it's just flipping a switch that will get that signal back on. As you can imagine, that saves us um, quite a bit of resources and time um, and we get the infrastructure back up and running. So this partnership has proven to be very useful. Next slide. 
So then um, with all of that groundwork that we had done ahead of time, um, as we were preparing for our very first uh, connected vehicle technology project, we um, decided on this corridor. It became obvious that this would be the ideal corridor, not only because we had made the infrastructure changes, but also because FDOT was now the operator and maintainer. Um, so we decided to deploy Kisco's and as you see here on this map, this is where the uh, traffic signals are, the pedestrian signals, the emergency signals, all of the uh, signals and devices that we operate and maintain from here. So our Kiss Coast project is going to um, be in the entire corridor, all the way from Key West to Key Largo. It's going to take about 112.5 miles um, worth of uh, infrastructure that we're going to put in. Um, next slide. So we chose the corridor and then we said, okay, let's look at this corridor. Let's see what are the needs here um, because we wanted to make sure that what we were deploying had a, a need and a use um, and benefits of course. So we looked at the characteristics of the corridor, the um, volumes were uh, significant. As you can imagine, there is uh, quite a bit of tourists as well as um, people here from South Florida that travel to the Keys, you know, on the weekends, et cetera. Um, we also found that there was a significant amount of truck traffic that used the corridor. Um, and then when we did the crash analysis, we saw that a large number of the crashes were occurring, no surprise, around the traffic signals. So um, this is a good sign indicating that connected vehicle technology, you know, and some of the applications that promise a lot of improvement in things like um, rear end crashes at intersections and things like that, uh, this would be a very good candidate for that. Uh, next slide, please. We also saw that in the corridor, there were uh, several freight trip generators. And as you guys know, there is a seaport down in, um, in the Keys as well as an airport. And there are many large retailers as well as a way station that is located in the Northern part uh, of the corridor. Next slide. We wanted to document as well the more multimodal aspect um, of US-1 down there. So we looked at whether there were any transit services and we found, as you see here, that there's actually uh, two service providers. We have Miami-Dade Transit in the northern part of the corridor. They have a bus route that goes from uh, Florida City all the way to Marathon Key. And Key West Transit also operates a shuttle in the lower um, or southern end of the corridor, which includes uh, service within the city of Key West, as you see in the map insert there. Next slide. So after looking at the characteristics and the needs of this corridor, we identified several applications, connected vehicle applications that uh, we wanted to include. And these, as you see here, included freight signal priority because of the significant number of freight trucks that traverse the corridor, um, the smart roadside and virtual WIM uh, application, because we do have that way and way in motion station in the corridor. But we also wanna um, see the benefits of having emergency vehicle preemption. And when we were doing our stakeholder coordination that we have been doing for quite some time, we talked to first responders, uh, law enforcement, et cetera, and they were very much interested in this uh, connected vehicle application. We also talked to the transit folks and transit signal priority is another application that we would like to test. And uh, we have enlisted some volunteers um, down in the Keys in order to test this in some of the um, local buses that they have there. Um, of course, traffic signal system is an application that will be tested because a lot of the infrastructure is gonna be deployed at the traffic signal locations. Um, there is a drawbridge in the Northern part of the Keys. So we are going to be testing connected vehicle applications for drawbridge management, mostly open and close uh, notifications for users of the connected vehicle. 
And then we also have pedestrians and cyclist safety applications that we would like to test as well as um, vehicle to vehicle safety. Um, so these are connected vehicle applications. The project itself is a little bit um, more, it has more scope than just the connected vehicle because we wanted to have an opportunity also since we do have the operations to look more um, closely at what the infrastructure is doing down there, specifically the traffic signal. So we are going to deploy automated traffic signal performance measures here at the Songhai TMC. And um, the security that comes with the system is something that um, is going to be implemented as well as a smartphone application that is going to target users like uh, pedestrians and cyclists. Next slide. So as you see here, we have um, identified 59 locations where we're going to install the roadside units. Um, and then we have a sample set of volunteer vehicles from local uh, entities of about 250. Um, and in those, we're going to be uh, installing onboard units to receive the information that the infrastructure is going to be sending from the roadside units. We are also going to be installing CCTV cameras at the traffic signals to allow our operators to have visibility uh, for their active arterial management. Um, tasks that they're going to be doing, and a few other things that you see here. Um, this list is not all inclusive. There's many other things that the project is going to do, but these are the main highlights of what we're going to be deploying. Next slide. So one of the things, as I said before, that we wanted to make sure is that we were not just testing connected vehicle applications for the sake of it, but that rather um, we were anticipating benefits uh, for the needs that had been identified along the corridors. So um, we do anticipate that this project will be um, aligned with the FDOT's vital few. As you guys know, uh, we have a high focus on improvement safety and uh, mobility, as well as you know having innovation because our staff here uh, is going to be uh, using uh, ATSPM, they're going to have a uh, connected vehicle experience that they're going to be building, um, etc. And then on top of that, we are going to be evaluating the effectiveness of what we deploy of this project, which we're still calling a pilot. Um, and for that, we have enlisted the help of uh, two university teams, uh, Florida International University, as well as uh, University of Florida. And there's a team of experts that will jointly work at looking at the, um, the before and after uh, this project so that we can document if these uh, applications are effective in targeting some of the um, issues that we identified along the US-1 corridor. Next slide. And that's the evaluation, thank you. So here is a snapshot of what the schedule looks like. We started working on this project uh, back in 2019. Currently we are um, in the design state um, and we are continuing from beginning to end, as I said before, our stakeholder coordination, because this is uh, a project that is going to be involving Monroe County, City of Key West, uh, as well as you know, several other entities that are going to be participating along with FDOT. And we do expect to have the project uh, operational by the spring of 2023, as you see here. If you could please go to the next slide, if you can. So we procure the project as a design build. Um, so we have a team that is doing, uh, completing the design, as I say right now, they're gonna build the project and um, hopefully by um, 2023, we will have it already operational. And then after that, we're gonna continue the evaluation for um, at least a year after, perhaps even two years, so that we can, as I said before, quantify the benefits. The award amount for this project was $5.1 million. Um, and we selected a firm, as you see here, that is uh, in charge of uh, making it happen. 
Okay, and I leave you guys with this safety message right in time for the holidays. Um, please remember driving and drinking, they don't mix. Uh, so thank you very much if you have questions. Yeah, thank you, gentlemen. Great presentation. We do have a couple of questions uh, for one. Benjamin. Benjamin, can you go ahead and unmute yourself? Hi, uh, this is Benjamin Restrepo from Broward MPO. I'm trying to get my video to work, but it's, it's not working. Um, uh, in one of your slides, you mentioned uh, data storage or data storage was listed there. I was just curious if data storage included ADT or peak hour turning movement counts. Well, the, the exact data that we are going to be stored is something that the design build firm is going to propose. Um, with the, as you can imagine, there is a high definition data that we have from the controllers. And then um, all of the data that can be collected from the sample of vehicles, it's going to be um, not necessarily dictated, but we are going to be uh, looking for the input of our um, FIU and UF teams that are putting together a series of performance measures that we are going to be uh, looking at. And so once the design build firm proposes the data that is going to be collected and stored, then we're going to try and decide on what will be um, selected. But we don't know at this point. We'll, we'll know more in the future. OK, thank you. OK. Thank you. Um, Buffy. Great presentation. Thank is you. there, um, I guess, any way besides the app that you're developing of doing some um, sharing of the data that you get with some of the other apps that people are using right now? So, I mean, in this world, there's a lot of apps out there, and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the, the data itself is going to belong to FDOT. Um, and as you know, FDOT is all about sharing. <laughs> we don't have a problem with that. Um, the app you know, solution, just like my previous answer, is something that is going to depend on what the design build firm proposes. Um, so we'll have to wait and see what they come up with and then um, see how we can leverage you know, its application or its availability with other um, available apps out there. So. Okay, thank so you. I have one more question. Um, mm -hmm. um, and I apologize if you might have mentioned this before, I might have missed it. Can you go a little bit more into detail about the use of the pedestrian and bicycle um, portion of the data that you're collecting and how you're gonna use this app to um, promote safety within the bicycle? So the, the ped, the pedestrian, as well as the cyclists, um, the way we are hoping to target them is by the use of the uh, cellular application. And uh, the connected vehicle technology that we're deploying, Buffy, the ROSA units, they are going to be transmitting the state of the signal, the signal phase and timing, um, et cetera. And the presence of the pedestrian is also going to be transmitted to the vehicles that are outfitted with the onboard units. In this case, we have a sample of about 250 of them. Uh, but with the app, we're going to be able to target more. So the presence of pedestrians or cyclists at the intersection, it's going to be something that it is our hope, as I said before, with my big disclaimer, this is still under design. Uh, so we're hoping to make that um, available for the users uh, of the connected vehicle uh, technology. At, at the beginning, that sample set of 250, but hopefully if we see that this is effective, we can expand that. Um, so it's mostly, you know, letting them know that there is a presence of pedestrians, uh, just like we will be letting them know when the, they are approaching the intersection and the intersection is about to turn green uh, or red, et cetera. Okay, thank you. No problem. Yeah, I don't think we have any more questions. Thank you, Yamilet. That very important identifying the, the pedestrian and cyclist. I think creating awareness is it's, it's key to safety. Um, we do have a Mentimeter question. Mentimeter quite. Oh, is there another question? Sorry, did I miss? Well, I do have one more question. I'm sorry, I thought it was. Uh, can you explain how you're um, selecting the vehicles that you're putting in? Are they all government vehicles, or are they just? No, here. 
So we, we wanted to have a good uh, sample. So we approached the government agencies down there, most, you know, the big ones, City of Marathon, Isla Morada, uh, Monroe County itself, uh, City of Key West. And, you know, we held meetings with them and they have agreed, at least we have a couple of uh, memorandums of agreement uh, and we're still working on a couple more. So they are going to make available to us the fire trucks, the um, first responder vehicles, the police cars, uh, as well as some of their maintenance fleet cars, uh, their buses that they um, operate in the routes that I showed you guys. So it's gonna be a good mixture of different types of vehicles, not just uh, passenger vehicles, but also uh, first responder. Um, we are hoping to have freight trucks uh, included as well so that we can test the whole variety of applications. But basically the way that we are um, recruiting them, if you want to call it, is by signing a memorandum of agreement that we have developed. And uh, we, we already have signed a few. Aside from these local agencies, then we also have our own uh, maintenance fleet that we're also going to be using uh, as part of the sample because they travel up and down the corridor quite a bit. So we'll be able to obtain data from their um, vehicles as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jamila. Thank you so much. We do have a, a Mentimeter question for Jamila's presentation. I'll stop sharing my screen. Stephanie. Very Ricardo. Thank you, Jamilet. Uh, yes, we have a question. And the question is, does your agency specifically identify support connected vehicle technologies in their policy and or plan documents? And we have five responses and all of them are no. <laughs> so I have a question for Jamilet. So you mentioned that um, you were working with entities in order to implement this pilot project uh, in, in other cities different from uh, Key West. Are you considering maybe Broward County? Any city in Broward County? Well, the, it's a district-led project. So as you mm -hmm. can imagine, FDOT is deploying it within the district. Mm -hmm. We are enlisting the um, these cities as volunteers. Uh, mm -hmm. So they, you know, they won't have to put in any costs or anything. They're simply volunteering their vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, I can say never, but at least for this one deployment, it's within District 6 at this point. So. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jamila. Great presentation. Thank you. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Come on, let's see why. Okay, any updates from the members? Uh, anything that's happening next month or so that you wanna share with the rest of the group? I don't know if Larry's there, I don't wanna put you in the spot, Larry, but I know something's going on with the city. I mean, sorry, with the state, District 4. Larry? Yes, Larry, so long with there. All right, anybody else? He's there, but his mic oh. seems to not be working. Larry, how are you? Anything, any, yes, you're there. Uh, his mic's not working. My oh, mic's not working. Sorry, Larry. That's okay, Larry. Technical difficulties. Okay, uh, nothing else from the rest of the group. I guess we don't have anything else to report. Um, Next, you know, I think we want to thank all the presenters. Great presentations today from FDOT, the city, uh, and also our, our own staff. Thank you so much for doing that. Great things. You know, how important it is to uh, engage the community often and implement the complete streets, technologies that's important for you know making our streets safer. And some, you know, some of this also share some of the tools that we have at the MPO at the MPO to help with those efforts as well. Ricardo, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, yes we, can. yes, we can. Okay, perfect. I had to unplug and replug my headphones then. Uh, yeah, uh, great uh, presentations today. Uh, well done. Um, I want to just mention about 
uh, bicycle advocacy groups were thinking about possibly sending out, um, you know, notices uh, or upcoming projects, any bicycle cycling groups. So if you have a list, Ricardo or Stephanie, of any cycling groups that would like would like to be added um, to, you know, like for upcoming projects, ongoing projects um, that they might be interested in, especially along A1A, US1 corridors. Um, okay. That's been a directive from management to reach out to the MPOs, see if there's any um, distribution lists for cycling advocacy groups. That would be great. So if you just yep. want to send me an email or give me a call after this meeting, it'll be great. That's all I had. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Larry. You're welcome. Next thing is your next meeting is on January 10th next year. So if we, got, we don't see each other, uh, happy new year to all of you. Um, all the meetings will be uh, still going to be held virtually via Zoom. And, and just a quick question for, you know, I, I, I really enjoy this virtual environment, but eventually we're gonna to have to go back uh, into in-person meeting. Um, just by raise, raise, just, I guess, raising your virtual hand, um, if you prefer to stay virtual, if you can just raise your hand, if you don't mind, see what the, the preference of the group is. And we have four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think we have like eight hand raised, hands raised, right, Rebecca? Not from what I can see. People are slowly right. raising their hands. I know we like our virtual environment, but we are trying to get more interaction with everyone. Yeah. We also may look at a, a hybrid option like we yeah. do with uh, our other committees. That could be the next, the best, next best, best option because I see a lot of hands raised here. Okay, we'll keep that in mind as we move forward. Again, we'll still have virtual, uh, potentially our next meeting could be a hybrid meeting. We'll definitely keep you guys posted. Again, don't forget uh, Tactical Urbanism, we're gonna be painting December 6, 7, and 8. Sign up if you're available to join us. And don't forget about the State Street Summit, uh, February 17 and 18, 2020 in Miami. All right, with that, that ends our, our meeting. Thank you again. Uh, we'll see you guys uh, next year. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye.